sound engineers, do we have the national anthem? Constanza as our opening prayer. Direct our noble cause. Guide our leaders right. Help our youth the truth to know. In love and honesty to grow. And living just and true. Great lofty heights attain. To build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Amen. A round of applause for yourselves and you may please be seated. Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, President of the Quantity of Years Registration Board of Nigeria, Board Members of the Quantity of Years Registration Board of Nigeria, President of the Nigerian of Quantity of Years, National Executive Council Members of the Nigerian of Quantity of Years, Past President of the Board, present here. Past presidents of NIQS present here, resource persons here, speakers, senior colleagues, fellows, members of the institute, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is QS Bolaji Shotunde, and I bid you all welcome to the 2022 Annual Assembly of the Quantities of Years Resolution Board of Nigeria and also the induction ceremony of newly registered Quantities of Years for the team, shaping the future of the quantity surveying profession. Please, a round of applause. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor for me to be here directing the affairs of this event and I'll be doing this alone I have with me a friend and a colleague who is going to be assisting with the direction of this assembly ladies and gentlemen I'd like to mention his name QS Timothy Binge will assist in coordinating these affairs ladies and gentlemen once again I say welcome Naturally, when you hear assembly, you probably hear speakers, probably you have chief whips, you have some other officers. I wouldn't know if today I can assign myself the role of the speaker of this assembly. And maybe QS Bingin can be the deputy speaker. Either way, we are here to this great event of all registered quantities of years in Nigeria. It is indeed an assembly of the professionals. It is indeed an assembly of the erudite members. It is indeed an assembly of individuals who have taken professionalism top on. 
and fulfilling their roles as members of QSRBN. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all and a round of applause for yourselves. Permit me to please get the ball rolling by welcoming up here and of course please with a standing ovation our chief servant Otala Aliyu for his opening remarks. Please a round of applause. Please keep clapping. Uh, President, Nigerian State of Conservatives, members of the Conservatives Registration Board of Nigeria, members of the National Executive Council of the Nigerian State of Conservatives, fellows of the Nigerian State of Conservatives, our distinguished colleagues, Conservatives, and the inductees. I'm in this place that um, we are holding this induction today. We're going to induct about um, almost 400 people. Not exactly 400, but almost 400 people. We're going to license them to practice the profession of conserving. So I welcome you all. And I sincerely hope that we'll have exciting two days today and tomorrow. In spite of the challenges, uh, both of movements and uh, pockets, we have this annual meeting. And uh, I, tr I truly personally appreciate uh, the commitment of members of the profession and make efforts to be here to talk to each other and discuss the prospects and the challenges of the profession. This year's theme of the annual assembly is shaping the future of the profession of conservation. Um, every profession has its own challenges. And every profession is part of a global challenge. We are not left out. Um, experts will come and talk to us about what we face today, the kind of disruptions we have in professions, the kind of challenges we have in the built environment, and the kind of challenges humanity has in terms of environmental issues that will shape the future, the future of relationships between man and man, man and woman, woman and woman, woman and environment, and between us and other professions. I will not take time in the welcoming because it's going to be another process tomorrow going through that, but I want to sincerely welcome you. And I want us to please conduct this um, induction ceremony in an orderly manner. Let's save the trouble also today and um, I'm sure by tomorrow uh, it will be the hype of the event. We've invited um, a specialist in ethics, values, and um, corporate issues to come and talk to our inductees today. Most of the time, we try to get outsiders to come and talk to us so that there's this interrelationship and there's also this appreciation of things that happen around us. And that people from other experts can also come and enrich us, uh, enrich our knowledge, and also build this bond of friendship and good marketing for the profession. So we will listen to our guest speaker, uh, and Lucas, who will talk to the inductees and also all of us. And we, I want to thank you all and welcome you Right. And, uh, Does have a citation? and I hope that uh, we'll enjoy our stay in Abuja for the next two days. Thank you very much. All right. Super. Now, if you if we have inductees here, if you're an inductee here, can you please show yourself by clapping? Inductees. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Let's let's try one more thing. Inductees, can you rise up and stand? Stand, stand, stand. Please a round of applause for this one. A round of applause. Super. Please, you may be seated. You may be seated. Um, you know, recently for me. 
All right. Please, I would like to welcome up here now. Um, some say the twin of the board. Some say the board came, the twin came before the board, or the board came before the twin. But they will always be together. Thank God for synergy. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call up here for his own remarks. The president of the Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, please, with a rounding, sounding round of applause, QS online mission to the FNIQS for his remarks. Please clap for Mr. President. The Nigerian Institute of Quantity Surveyors is actually the parent of the Quantity Surveyors Institution body. <laughs> The NIQS was founded in 1969 and they fought strenuously to make sure that the board was set up through an act in 1986. So you can see that uh, we are actually the parents, although our child now controls us. You know, sometimes you say when you get to a certain age, you will be led by your son. Or by your child. And I think that is what is happening here. <laughs> well, the representative of the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, the President of the Equalities of Your Registration Board of Nigeria, my own dear senior brother, the Mutawali Gumbi, KOS, Mutala, Mohamed Ali, the members of the board of the QS RPN. The members of the National Executive Council here present, invited guests, fellows in our midst, the corporate members, our, our dear inductees. It's indeed a delight for me to stand here before all of you, and I must congratulate the new inductees. And I think you also need to congratulate yourself. And I think you deserve to clap for yourself like uh, the Bolaji <laughs> has All of you have come a long way to get to this point today, where you are now being officially licensed. Yes, we need induction for you. We admitted you into our own body, the NIQS. But here, you are now being given the license to practice and I hope you understand the implication like I say everywhere one bad apple spoil the whole bunch quantity surveying is a very noble and highly esteemed profession that those who handed it over to us those who founded the NIQS in 1969 had worked, they worked tirelessly to hand it over to us, they guarded the image of the profession. And I want to admonish all of you as you are going to be inducted to practice. Please continue the legacy, within the legacy that has been laid down for all of us, that is to practice with honesty and integrity, with respect for your professional colleagues. And I'll say that again, with respect, utmost respect for your professional colleagues. I've had instances of uh, quantities of yours who are in consulting, who rubbish their colleagues in contracting. I've had of instances of quantities of yours who work with client organizations who undermine their colleagues who work in consulting. I've heard of fellow consulting quantities of yours who try to undermine each other. Please, as you are coming in, I want to admonish you not to follow that path. We all have this profession to protect. I don't think, well, there are some who have gone to study some other things and maybe are now barristers or what have you. But for some of us, the only profession that we have and we cherish and which we will practice until we die is quantity survey. 
So please, I want to beg and appeal to you as you join us, make sure that you help us to maintain that integrity. I'm sure in the course of this assembly, we we'll also talk about how do we ensure that the future is bright for you. Feel free to ask questions if need be. Feel free to consult your senior colleagues if you have doubts. Once again, I congratulate you all and I wish you a wonderful time in the profession. God bless you. You know, as um, as a, as a speaker of the house, um, one of the few things that can also of engagement, couple to come below and the Jacob went ahead to discuss the issue for our lady. Uh, maybe this far above who is who. A round of applause for, for the gentleman again, once again. All right, um, inductees. Um, this is one of the very few moments, quite important for me, if I will say, um, part of this assembly. And um, we're going to go into the induction speech. It is important that you all are here, not just here, you are listening. And to the members we have joining us online as well, it's also important that you do not miss out of this information that is about to come from the table of the, our guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Our guest speaker today is a managing consultant with Tenable Concepts Limited. And the core of what she does is about change management from the human perspective point of view, cultural orientation, intentional culture management change orientation the human mind the guest speaker over time has distinguished herself in these areas and i have no doubt that in addressing this topic on ethical conduct, professionalism, and general expectation of professional quantity surveyors, he is more than prepared to do justice to this presentation. The same ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to welcome up here our guest speaker, Mrs. Esther Dollar for our presentation. Please, a round of applause for her. Please clap. Where are the women? Please, no, the men. Rest. And the women as well. Thank you very much, Ma, for your presence. while I see how the PowerPoint is. PowerPoint, can someone? Your custodians of recognized specialist skills. It's not just a career, but you're being inducted into a profession and there are additional responsibilities and expectations with being part of a profession. Now, the genesis of professions, they're one of society's most important institutions because they're the specific social structures by which the society can enjoy 
and have a measure of control over the use of your specialized knowledge and skills. It's particularly true when highly valued aspects of human life depend on such expertise as in your case. Because construction, of which you are an integral part, is the process through which the entire built environment is created. In fact, the modern construction sector in Nigeria is providing the means by which the new Nigeria will be built. So the level of its performance and your performance will contribute to the quality of life for the current generation as well as determine the future legacy. So since it's the quantities of air's responsibility to manage all the costs associated with construction and building, you're actually more than cost accountants. You're the custodians of people's hopes that their money will be judiciously used and the end product will stand the test of time. And being a profession, it, it recognizes that acquiring your expertise requires lengthy theoretical education and intensive training. So you have an exclusive set of knowledge. That, was the gen that is the genesis of creating the institutions of professions, not just quality surveying profession, medical profession, legal profession, etc. I have a slide up there. It says a professional is a member of a profession or any person who earns a living from a specified professional activity. The term also describes the standards of education and training that prepares members of the profession with the particular knowledge and skills necessary to perform their specific roles within that profession. In addition, most professionals are subject to strict codes of conduct, codes of conduct that enshrine rigorous ethical and moral obligations. Professional standards of practice and ethics for a particular field are typically agreed upon and maintained through widely pro recognized professional associations, in your case, NIQS and QSRBN. Okay. I'm having a problem with moving. Is there someone who can help me with the slides? Times. An induction ceremony like this, people believe that it's by publicly taking an oath that a person becomes a professional and acquires specific professional obligations. By um, the Latin word professio means to declare publicly. So today you're not just taking an oath, you're presenting yourselves to others as possessors and practitioners of a profession's expertise. And you're declaring publicly that you're members of a profession and you accept the ethical commitments of that profession as your own. So the oath today is also a reminder that as you begin professional practice, that important ethical commi commitments go with it. And it's also a public assurance to the larger community and to the public by yourselves that you understand and accept that re reality. Some people say that the vocation or calling of the committed professional is precisely a social vo vocation. By that I mean a calling to ethical relationships with your clients, with those you serve, in the context of your relationship with the larger community. In fact, this practice of specialized expertise and the special moral commitments associated with professional practice, they are the things that differentiate a profession from other occupations. What dif differentiates a, profession, a professional from just a trader who's hawking his wares or his knowledge is the fact that there are commitments and obligations that go with it. The way you conduct, your prof the way you conduct yourself, the way you deliver your service, and the general um, level of service that the public will expect. Now they're key... Okay. So you've gone ahead, there are a couple of slides before that. Now they're key features of a profession. It's not easy to distinguish what makes a profession, but you'll find that there are essential elements. The first one being that you have important and exclusive 
expertise. An exclusive expertise. For an occupational group to be a professional, it must provide its clients with something that the larger community judges extremely valuable, either because of its intrinsic value or because it's a necessary precondition of any person's achievement of valued goals. There must be internal and external recognition. Internal relationships, of which the most important is the mutual re recognition of expertise on the part of its members. It's internal recognition like this that has informed um, an occasion like this today. And then also external recognition, external recognition to the larger community. For that, um, your certificates and your licenses come into play. The third one being autonomy in matters of expert practice. Those served by a profession routinely grants its members extensive autonomy in the per performance of the profession's practice. For example, if someone takes on a quantity surveyor, they're going to give you full reign to do your work. They're not going to be interfering. They're going to be interested in the end product. But how you arrive at the end product is up to you and up to your own particular style and way of doing things. And then the final, and for present purposes, the most important feature of the institution of profession is that, is that membership in a profession implies the acceptance by its members of a set of ethical standards of professional practice. We'll be going into that in a bit more detail. So what are the kind of professional norms that we're talking about that guide your conduct, that guide your way of delivering your services? Um, there's some questions that you need to have at the back of your mind and briefly stated the nine categories of questions about professional obligations are who are the profession's chief clients? What are the central values of your profession? I know that your, prof your profession has um, some guiding values. What is the ideal relationship between a member of this profession and a client, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is transparency, honesty. Now, what sacrifices are required of members of this profession? And in what respects do the obligations of this profession take priority over other morally relevant considerations affecting its members? What are the norms of competence for this profession? I know that apart from um, your degree, I know that there are various um, prof uh, professional exams and continuous improvement programs that both NIQS and QSRBN have for quantity surveyors to take. What is the ideal relationship between the members of this profession and co-professionals? Now since um, your profession doesn't exist in a vacuum, you work with architects, you work with engineers and the rest of it, the way in which you relate to them is also important. What is the ideal relationship between members of this profession and the larger community? What ought the members of this profession do to make access to the profession services available to everyone who needs them? I think this is an important, um, important one for quantity surveyors. I think you'll find that a lot of people are not quite sure of what quantity surveyors do and the value that they bring to the table. I think I'm correct that when people are, or even individuals, are wanting to build a building, they don't necessarily think that they need a quantity surveyor. And I think that um, there's an opportunity to build awareness about the value that you bring to the table and the difference that you make, especially in light of the things that we've seen happen in re recent times. What are the members of this profession obligated to do to preserve the integrity of their commitment to its values and to educate others about them? So, I've highlighted that it's ethics that distinguish a professional from a common trader. So we need to look closer at what is ethics. 
Ethics refers to a standard governing the conduct of a person or members of a profession. There are three aspects to ethics. How you discern right from wrong, doing what is right, and to capture it all, ethics is action, the way you practice your value system. It's a guidance system, almost like your internal compass that you use in making decisions. Now when we come together like this and we start talking about ethics, it can seem very abstract, it can seem like it's difficult to relate it to my everyday actions. But you'll find that when you begin to investigate it at a deeper level and interrogate ethics, you'll find that, um, you'll find that a lack of ethics is actually the bane of Nigeria right now. It is what has led us to where we are. So let's look at the impact of the lack of ethics to help us understand the importance of ethics. And I'm going to look at it from a macro perspective, from a national perspective, and highlight certain things that we're all very, very familiar with. Every time a police officer receives a bribe to cover up an issue, it encourages disobedience to law, which ultimately fuels the breakdown of law and order. You also have police extortion targets. Health professionals who divert medical supplies from public institutions where they're to be administered to the sick, they may benefit from the Ill -got their ill-gotten wealth, but their actions increase health-related problems in the society and impacts negatively on national productivity. I'm sure that most of you, like me, you come from large, you have a large extended family. I had a cousin who was a victim to something like this. She was pregnant, went to the hospital, was given expired drugs, it put her into, she lost the baby, and apart from that, it caused a lot of other health issues for her. And investigating that, we discovered that the, when the drugs come to the hospital, the matron takes the drugs, and she has a pharmacy in town where she sells them. And when they're almost at their expiry date, she brings them back to the hospital to be used. So most of the drugs within the hospital are about to expire or already expired. Slow movement of files in offices, public service officers who engage in over invoicing, in connivance with contractors to loot the public treasury. They're diverting resources which should be deployed to provide physical and social infrastructure to improve the living standards of the average Nigerian. The ghost worker syndrome, The ghost worker syndrome. Um, at the inception of IPPIS in Kaduna, I happened to be there, and um, I went to see some people that I know, and I happened to hear a conversation going on next to me. And there was a civil servant there who was bemoaning the fact that he had 80 ghost workers. He had had 80 ghost workers, and he'd been enjoying that for about five years. And now because of IPPIS, he didn't have them anymore. So his lament was, how am I now supposed to take care of my family, my siblings, my parents, my people in the village? He didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing. He felt that something bad had been done to him. Now that, that is an indication of how far from what is right, you know, some people in Nigeria have gone. And I think the general public as well. Election irregularities, substandard buildings and infrastructure. Substandard buildings and infrastructure. It's not too long ago we had, uh, I think, the biggest construction disaster in Nigeria, the Ikoyi building collapse. Now what's interesting about that is that there's been so much conversation about what happened, the lack of regulatory oversight and the rest of it, but a lot of people believe because you're associated, you are the uh, profession that's most closely associated with costings of any project, that I heard people saying, let's see the quantity surveyors bill of estimates, let's see their BOQ which quantity surveyors were attached 
to this job. Now, as more and more has come out about that um, Ikoi building collapse, it's, it's become clear that the developer was developing this building by direct labor and that he, um, there were a lot of shortcuts. I'm not even sure whether he actually employed the services of a quantity surveyor, but the perception of the public is, is important and it's important to you because it's what you're going to be working against when you're um, marketing your services or when people come to you for work. Now, there are dangers and consequences of unethical behaviors. Unethical conduct, immorality or negative values are devoid of ethical ben benchmarks. They're dangerous social evils, they're damaging to the society to the extent of leading to a failed state. And like all forms of things that are wrong, the dangers are multifaceted and some of them concrete. For example, loss of international credibility. It's interesting that the, um, the title of the theme of this um, annual assembly is shaping the future of the quantity surveying profession. Now, quantity surveying is local, but it's also global, just like everything else. And in terms of growing and sustaining the profession, I know that the board is looking to not just deepening the quantity surveying profession within Nigeria, but also cross-border alliances. And um, when you look at that, you find that one of the reasons that people are reluctant to come into any form of alliance with a Nigerian company or with Nigerians is specifically because of these issues that we are talking about. I believe it was at one of the um, uh, quantity survey events where I talked about the potential of marketing the services of a Nigerian quantity surveyor to other countries within the West African sub-region that are enjoying a construction boom, for example, Equatorial Guinea, some of these countries that are new, um, new affluence, but we found that they would prefer to bring in professionals from Europe and South Africa, rather than coming to what should be the obvious place, Nigeria. And it's specifically because of these issues that we are discussing here today. Um, so there's a loss of international credibility, educational certificates. People who have graduated in Nigeria, let's say doctors, lawyers, even if they've practiced here for 10 years and they want to re relocate, the fact that they have a Nigerian um, certificate or that they were trained in Nigeria, they find that they have to go through certain qualification requirements that other people don't have to. Because the assumption is that they may have bought this degree, or they, someone else might have sat for them, or all the things that we know can happen within our educational system. Financial institution documents are disrespected. I remember there was a time when, um, um, in the UK, the UK came out with a list of people that they would not open bank accounts for, and they had things like people who'd been convicted of so-so-so crimes, people, the, uh, all the different people that work there. So it really had a certificate to say this is what caused it. But, you know, and from, where, from that spark, it began to spark, and before they knew it, it had taken his house, caught fire. Within 30 minutes, 80% of the house had burnt down. His wife had to jump from the balcony. He barely came down. Companies cut corners to improve profit margins. Culture of liberty of hard work. Inability to develop tourist potential. The consultancy I was working on, so I happened to, and most of us thought it was because of the high cost of power in the country and the epileptic power supplies over the last you know, couple of years, is that the way we are structured is that there's certain middle to find the quality that has become prevalent in our society. 
and the lack of appreciation of Hamas. I mean, uh, when you have um, unethical conduct on a macro level, on a society level, all of us long for a society that children can grow up in and stand up. You can't function, the rest of your body parts depend on your spine. It's a conflict of interest, factors, failure to submit essential documents promptly, inflating quantities in bill of quantities, inflating the contract sum, charging clients for work that you have not done, revealing official secrets, collusion with other professionals, using poor quality goods. What does this lead to? Dissatisfied clients, late compensation due to delays, low productivity, efficiency of your project team, deterioration in professionalism, poor workmanship, high maintenance, upward review of contract costs, poor project coordination, poor quality infrastructure development, the stunted growth of your industry, reduction in the lifespan of building, loss of public trust, and conflicts between the client and the construction true team. So we can conclude that ethical principles have a commercial value, or more importantly, the absence of commercial values has a commercial cost that can be devastating. So the focus um, in education is always on the technical competencies. And more and more people are beginning to realize that there's certain personal attributes, we call them character competences, competencies, that are actually more important because they determine how you will use the, um, the technical competencies that you have. The personal attributes that we're talking about, they're like the soil. Anybody who's a farmer will know that the crop you get is only as good as the soil. That's why a farmer takes a lot of time um, working on the preparation of his soil, making sure it has the right nutrients, the right water, everything that it needs to support the growth of the plant. In the same way, um, it's important that our educational institutions also begin to emphasize the personal attributes that underlie any expertise. So, in conclusion, competency for construction professionals is generally agreed to comprise of two elements. The actual performance of a required skill and the personal attributes which underlie such performance. There is no doubt the technical knowledge in the required area of a profession is crucial when working in all aspects of the construction industry, including quantity surveying. But there's a growing belief that the personal attributes of character, values and attitude are more important in optimizing performance in the industry. Hence the focus of this talk. The importance of individual values, ethical conduct, is an essential element in developing a better practice culture in the construction industry. These aspects determine the attention to detail and the quality of the finished work. However, emphasis of learning for quantity surveyors has traditionally focused on technical and performance knowledge, which is regarded as a necessity, with less consideration on approaches to internalize and establish ethical values and conduct into the professionals. I know that the leadership of the quantity surveying profession are looking at how they can incorporate ongoing ethics education at different um, stages of a quantity surveyor's life. And I believe that conversation is still ongoing. So how do we maintain ethics? Now there are actually two policemen of ethics and we are more familiar with the external policemen of ethics, that is, ethics codes, codes of contacts, codes of conduct, sorry, contracts, regulations, enforcement, as well as the fear of reputation loss. Now, current thinking has recognized that ethics codes on their own can only go so 
far. They, don't, they cannot cover every single scenario that a quantity surveyor or any other professional will face. And they also do not make a bad person good. And what we found is that, especially in Nigeria, because Nigerians are very, very creative, they find ways of going around the ethics code to, to do what they wanted to do in the first place. That's why continuing ethics education is important. Now the second policeman of ethics is the internal policeman, what we call the conscience. And that is like a muscle. So when we talk about ongoing ethics education, we're talking about, it's almost like a muscle, an internal muscle that nobody can see. And it's strengthening that part of your character to do the right thing and to withstand the pressure and to go against the flow especially if you are you find yourself in a situation where everybody's doing things in a particular way and your own internal moral compass tells you that this is not what you want to do this is not the right thing to do you're not doing the right thing by your client you need internal strength and that internal strength has to be practiced it's just like going to a gym and you want to build muscles, you don't build the muscles in day one. You have to continuously practice. And the continuous practice comes by applying your code or applying your own principles and your own value system to situations that you find yourself in. Now, what are the benefits of ethics? You stand out amongst the crowd. You're better positioned to manage strategic alliances internationally and you have a greater and more loyal customer base. Just to bring it home, you, you find that people will trust you. For example, everybody's looking for a trustworthy mechanic and they're willing to pay more for a trustworthy mechanic. A mechanic who will actually do, tell you what is actually wrong with your car, will actually tell you the cost of the parts and will actually you know, tell, show you the difference between what his, his, the cost of his labor and the cost of, um, and the, of the parts. And we'll actually tell you the implications of not changing the parts. And you find that you go back to him more and more. And you even be willing to pay a little bit more. You'll actually um, recommend him to other people. It's the same thing in your profession. So like I said, yes, having a code of ethics without creating an ethical culture and a comprehensive ethics program is having a Ferrari without wheels. It looks good, but you're not going anywhere. So, I want to talk about a quality that is important in everything that we're speaking about. And that's the, quality, that's the quality that I call personal responsibility. I've outlined to you some of the factors that have led us to where we are. And what I find a lot of us, and even myself doing, is we tend to say, when this happens, then I'll do this. When we have the right leader, when this system is working, when I get the right pay, or I have the right boss, or I'm in the right, um, the right job, the job that I want, then I'll actually address these issues. And so what we're doing is disconnecting from the issue and refusing to take ownership and personal responsibility of the situation and refusing to recognize that our own individual choices, what we're doing on a daily basis, is either contributing to the problem or addressing the problem. So the question now is who will stop the slide? Is it worth it? to you individually? Is it worth it corporately? 
is it worth it as a profession? Now, I know that um, from conversations with the leadership that they're putting in place different things to address the ethical issues of quantity surveyors. Well, we don't ha you don't have to wait till that is done because when you have a strong personal ethic, it's much easier to connect to your professional code of ethics. And so one of the things that you can do going forward, even before the leadership come up with the different programs that they have in mind, is to intentionally develop your own personal code of ethics. Now your personal code of ethics is actually a summary of who you are as a person. Who you are as a person. So take some time to think about who am I? Even who do I want to be? How do I want to live this life? The truth of the matter is that there is only this life that we have to make a mark. And how the choices we make on a daily basis determines the legacy that we leave. The legacy we leave for our family, the name that we leave for our family, and the, um, the legacy we leave in our profession. So, there are a few things that you can start doing. What is a personal ethics statement? It's a statement developed by an individual and it reflects your most important personal values and road morals used to build your roadmap for living. What is the statement meant to do? It represents what we strive to be, influences our actions and interactions, demonstrates how you put your guiding ideals into practice, it serves as a support system for decision making, it becomes your go-to during difficult situations, especially when there's nobody around that you can talk to or use as a sounding board. How do you build your statement? Decide, take, take some time. This is not something that you can do in 20 minutes. Once you kickstart the thinking process, these are some questions to guide you. Decide on the values and morals that are most important to you. Decide on your format. Work on your statement over time. Consider, consider sharing it with others for feedback and keep it somewhere handy. A good place to start is to make a list of the, all the I wills, the things you commit to, the things that people can expect, and how your actions will reflect that, especially in terms of the kind of actions that you take in exercising your profession. Why should we bother with personal, ethic, personal ethics? Strong personal ethics typically translate into worthwhile benefits. You have trusted relationships at home and work, valued contributions at home and work, positive attention from employers, families and friends, peace of mind, better overall health, emotional stability, and lasting relationships. And you need to be also be a little bit careful when you're making your ethics, um, ethics personal ethics statement have this in your back of your mind. Are you rationalizing? Are you saying everybody does it? Are you saying nobody will notice? I don't pay, get paid enough to deal with that. It'll take too much time to do it right. Just this one time. It's not like I'm hurting anyone. I'm not a whistleblower. I'm too close to retirement. I'm minding my own business. These are all red flags, dangerous red flags that as much as possible, you should try to avoid. And I want to say that um, it's important to, to, when you commit to a process like this, start small. Just pick one particular area that you're going to work on and then begin to add, if, if you see that there's certain areas for improvement in yourself and in the way in which you are uh, exercising your profession, pick a small area. It can be something like timekeeping commit to getting on time and as you as that is no longer an issue pick something else 
Because if you try to do everything at once, you'll get disillusioned and most likely give up. So, come to the end of my time with you, but I just want to say how you choose to deliver your services as a quantity surveyor is a reflection of your character. It's a reflection of who you are. And no one can determine that for you by, but yourself. So I think we've come to a place as a nation and as individuals where we need to really deeply reflect on who we are, how we do things, and the impact it has. And then take responsibility for the areas, the area of influence that we have and begin to make a difference in those areas. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, food, food, so much, so much. Um, it's worded and um, I do hope that uh, I don't tease questions and answers all right go very quickly we have about 15 to 20 minutes to look at questions and answers so please qs timothy is going to assist me with this session if any one of you if you have a question you can please indicate by raising your hand you have a question for a plan. Is that okay? Can we have that done? Yeah. Super. So can I have the um, can I have um, the uh, presentation brother? Clap, clap. Very good. This is Kathy. Um, what's uh, uh, there was this moment uh, despite uh, a reminder all of us professionals is a and our whole house as Nigerians and as human beings. My name is Sally, thank you very much. And um, we, this was your first contact with the profession and I'm confident that the time and from time to time we began to not only talk to us but support us in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Please a round of applause once more. Thank you, madam. The oath taking session, and at this point in time, I'll please want to hand over to the president of the board once again. Thank you. I hope the inductees have their own copies of the oath. Do you have your copies? Now can the inductees stand where they have this? Can you all stand where you are? Aye. I will abide by all rules and regulations controlling the practice of the profession in all its aspects and ramifications. And other obligations. I will fulfill all financial Sanctioned by the board for the continual blessing of my name on the register. Sanctioned by the board for the continual blessing of my name on the register. 
Congratulations. Uh, please be seated. We're going to have presentation of uh, selected certificates. Can I please have um, the certificate up here so that Mr. President can can do us the honors just before he goes back to his seat. And the way our inductees are dressed today, it is not a one-off. Eh? It's not a one-off. The way you are dressed today, being inducted, is, is perhaps the way you induct your professionalism moving forward. QS Suleiman Abubakar will give a minute just say thank you to. Excellency, sorry, I was just trying to find Honorable you. Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Rajin Hashola, openly represented. The President, Quantity Surveillance Association Board of Nigeria, QS Mohammed Mutala Aliyu, FNIQS, FNIQS. Members of the National Executive Council here present. <laughs> NIQS Chapter Chairman here present. <laughs> Members of the National Assembly here present. <laughs> Allied professional bodies here present. Members of our families and friends here are present. 
Ladies, uh, uh, gentlemen of the press, distinguished uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Suleiman Abubakar Buba. I stand on behalf of all the inductees uh, to give a glory to Almighty God for making us to be among the uh, registered country surveyors in our dear country. And I pray, may the Almighty God bless the certificate and make it useful, uh, useful to us and the humanity. Uh, secondly, to, to thank the, the president of the country Survey Association Board of Nigeria, QS Mohammed Murtala Aliyu, FNIQS, PBNIQS, Mateo Langombe, for his effort in making this uh, event colorful. May I, at this juncture, ask all the inductees to give a big round of applause for the president, please. Thank you very much, Batole. Uh, lastly, I wish each and, every, each and every one of us here joining my Simba to our various destination. Long live Quantity Surveyors Resolution Board of Nigeria. Long live Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much. To come up here for that presidential handshake and the certificate. QS Robert Joseph Nadioni, are you here? Okay, while well, we're waiting for him to come up here. Is that QS Robert Joseph? Okay. I was thinking the name did not sound familiar because of the QS. QS is a Francis Saya Saidu. Abdul Kaji Abu Bakar Kawasu QS Papule Dansu Fumbi QS Papule Dansu Fumbi Emil Fiyok Ubo QS Tom Okay. Okay, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for yourselves. Thank you. We do want to appreciate past presidents of the board who of the board who came in. Um, past president. Okay. Round of this morning session. Uh, and Ajali Koko is also here and also president of Castle. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, 388 um, people have not been inducted uh, yeah. into the field of quantity survey yes. or as professionals in the field. Uh, what um, message do you have for them? Well, they are, they are not just professionals. All right. in, if I... in November, they were. A doctor that's professional. Now they're getting license. They are getting the license to practice as uh, elected by the law of the country. So I will keep on your um, I think the important thing is to maintain the ethical standards of the profession uh, to ensure probity, to ensure professionalism, to ensure that uh, wherever they find themselves, they are good ambassadors of the profession on the country. Thank you very much. Who is going to give? a goodwill on behalf of former past presidents of the board. Please welcome here, please a round of applause as I welcome past president Diko um, as he comes up for a goodwill message. Please clap for him, please. Thank you very much, sir. members that were inducted today and we are very very happy to have that substantial addition. Many many years ago 
the total strength of registered quantities abuse is not even up to the numbers that were adopted only this morning. So that summarizes the progress that we had as a profession. But even with that progress, the numbers are inadequate when compared to the need of the economy of the nation. But we are not only interested in having numbers, we are actually interested in having quality members that can make a difference. The reason why that is very important is that the profession, in fact, the entire professions, allied and otherwise, are facing some kind of monumental changes that uh, they have to do a lot of soul searching if they will continue to be relevant. One of the things that you must take from today is the lecture that we have just had that centered on ethics and uh, doing the right things. Once that one is in place, it will open the doors to a lot of other possibilities. It is in our interest to do our very best to meet the challenges of the changing environment and the future to ensure that we remain relevant. So as you go in into the profession, don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid to be innovative. Don't be afraid to bring to the table something that has not been tried before. That is the only way that will continue to be relevant. I'm very, very happy with uh, what we have had today. I'm indeed proud to be associated with all of you. I'm sure you will be a very good ambassadors to the profession to assist to the development of the nation at large. Once again, congratulations. All that you have had is something that you need to imbibe in yourself and hold there for life. It's not just because you succeed, you've succeeded in getting the certificate now. So on behalf of the past presidents here present and those that have said their goodwill not being with us today, and the entire family of the QSRBN and the NIQS, once again, congratulations and you are welcome on board. Thank you. Please also rise with them. Not to worry, the NC will also follow you. No problem about that. With you all the way. Uh, board members, please. To the right, my right. Thank you very much. By the NIQS Foundation, which is supposed to be tomorrow, but it has been shifted for today. So please, I want you to take note. We shall be having a presentation on QS Cloud software by one of us, and um, I'm sure he will uh, do justice when he comes on stage. You will agree with me that there are so many softwares in the market now, but this one is locally developed, and it's only proper for us to patronize our colleague because of the peculiarities of our own country. This software has been designed MNIQS, RQS, to come and do a presentation on the QS Cloud software. Can we please put our hands together for him? We are delighted and thankful to make uh, this presentation. In the 2020 annual Assembly of Registered Contributors, 
the Malamutala Aliyu led QSRBM board gave us the opportunity to make a presentation on our developmental effort on this software to these to the audience of registered quantity surveyors at the time. At that time, we were working on the software. There were contributions from colleagues. There are contributions from those in the academia on what and what should be included. We kept working. As of today, it is a commercial product. Some points of yours in the country, from Botago to Lagos, from Abuja to Taraba states, are using Q Cloud Custom. We appreciate the support we received from the board till date. We really, really appreciate it. And once again, uh, the president, QSRBN, we appreciate that. We appreciate the encouragement we get from people like uh, the castle president, Mr. Shegwan Jan I was in his office in Lagos. I made a presentation, a presentation to him. He encouraged me, he even gave me a contact of uh, someone in the UK. I could reach out to, I should mention his name. We appreciate such support. Our colleagues in academia, those in Amadou Bello University, have been of great support. We really appreciate the support. Professor Doko Ibrahim, on, uh, the chairman of the local organizing committee for this uh, uh, event. Uh, we appreciate everything you, you've been doing uh, to, to encourage our effort along this line. When you look at most cost management software, you notice that they are not indigenous. That's just the truth. You can identify a world-class cost management software that is Nigerian. Plan Swift US, QS Card UK, QS Plus South Africa, Costes Australia. And so we felt we should assemble a team and build a cost, a world-class cost management software for creating cost information by Nigerian points of view. At least we begin at home before going outside. Most points of yours, as a matter of fact, still work manually. And that's understood. The prices of most cost management software is priced beyond the reach of most points of yours. When you see a number of points of yours using some software, watch clearly, pirate it copy. That's unethical in the spirit of what we discussed earlier. That's just the truth. It's unethical. So we felt like we should be able to build something for the use of the community, the cost management community in this country. And so what I've been presenting to you is the basic features, the most important features of the software. I will be sharing my screen. I think I've been allowed to share my screen now. I'll be sharing my screen for you to see quantities. When you have two-dimensional drawings, whether hard copies or soft copies, QCloud costing allows you to prepare detailed estimates, also known as bill of quantities. It is the library, the standard library of descriptions in QCloud costing is based on the, the NIQS BSMM4R. That is the mom that we support. Although other moms could be used, we have a feature that allows you to use other mom. When I talk about mom, I mean method of measurement. So you could use NRM2, for example, which is the mom used in the United Kingdom. You could use SMMG, standard method of measurement, or Ghana, which is the mom used in Ghana. So we have a library editor that allows you to build your own custom-made library of descriptions. Again, that's a feature you not see in most other software you see around. Now, this presentation is not talking about building such standard library. That is an advanced presentation, something we do later in our weekly uh, online presentations. Now, I said earlier I want to begin with end in mind. So how does a build from QCloud look like? Let me just show you. Now, I've got what you are looking at, um, what you are looking at on the screen, that interface is what we call the payment item worksheet. That's a worksheet that contains the BOQ items. 
Every POQ item is a payment item because that's what the client is paying for. That's what the client is paying for. So the payment item worksheet allows you to checklist the items you want to quantify, the items the client is paying for. So whenever you launch the software at any given time, what you see is that payment item worksheet. But if you are starting a fresh project, it's better we begin by entering details of the project we are starting. And to do that, you come up here, that's the top. Look at my screen, you see my cursor. The top left, you see three horizontal lines. That icon, that button, is the global, is the, um, the global, the icon for the global menu of the software. So you click on it. You see project view, template view, and a, a, a host of other things. Click on project view. When you click on project view, you see a new item, a new, uh, 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 what's it called? Worksheet. That is a manage project worksheet. The manage project worksheet allows us to enter details of the projects we want to work on or quantify. But before I show you that, just have a look at a typical bill prepared by the uh, using the QCloud custom. So this is a typical bill, for example. So you right click, and when you right click, you see a menu, click open. So, so you have, that's the bill. So you could, you could scroll up and then, that's the bill. Now I want to talk about the dashboard, that graph-like part of the software you are looking at. There are two of them. On the left hand side is a graph that distributes the cost of the project after pricing over the different elements that make up the project. So you have a visual idea of the relative cost of the different elements. If you look closely in that place, you will notice that the first item there, that substructure for that project, is what is uh, one of the highest uh, uh, elements. Another one is the external works. So the two of them, substructure external works of high, uh, of high cost. So that dashboard enables you as you price, automatically it distributes the cost of the project over the different elements. The second dashboard does the same thing, but this time around it distributes the, the cost of the project over the different work packages or trades something that will interest a contractor's quantity surveyor. Of course, you can generate an elemental bill or generate a trade bill after your measurement. Now, at the top is the report uh, icon. That's what you can see after the delete button. So click on it to generate the printer the bill. What you see here is the report setting view. So click on reports. So you have POQ, elemental, here we go. That is uh, the bill. That's your bill. Print ready. You don't need to adjust columns, adjust rows, do any adjustment. Print ready. Just print and get out of the environment. So that's how a typical uh, bill prepared by the QCloud looks like. An interesting feature is this. Notice that the reference symbol for the item, for the POQ items, or the payment items, is the traditional alphabet, A, B, C, D. If you are interested in using the BSMN 4R code for identifying the items, all you have to do is to go to the report setting view, go to report setting view, and then click on report setting. That's the report setting view. Click on preferences. I want to change my reference, uh, the, 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 the reference symbol for my payment items, for my BOQ items. I want to change it from the traditional ABCD to the BSMN 4R code. So click on preferences and then scroll up, look for bill item coding. Here we have bill item coding on the left hand side and on the right hand side you see what you are going to share in your alphabetic series, just
click on that, you have BSMM code. Check BSMM code and then click save. Certain save. If you regenerate your bill now, the code for the items are no longer the traditional A, B, C, D, but um, the, the, the BSMM uh, the BSMM code. So let's let's look at it. Let's look at it. So that's that shape is not uh, effective. Sorry, let me I repeat that process again. I'm on the payment item worksheet. I go to reports certain. Go to reports. So, preferences. And on preferences, I have a DSMM4 code. That is what is there now. I click on that. I say save. before and this presentation is this how do you move from a blank payment item worksheet to a, 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 a worksheet a payment item worksheet that contains the items how do you do that so like I said earlier you're on the payment item worksheet when you launch the software you come up to your top uh, left click on that global menu icon select uh, Select project view, then you have manage project worksheet. So use the add button at the bottom right. Use the add button at the bottom right to enter details of your project. So let's say project title. Let's just say RQS project. Let's say that's the name, RQS project. That's the title of our project. And then click save. So you've Enter a record of what you are working on. So, if you look at my Manage Project Worksheet, the worksheet that allows you to track all your projects in a single location, you will notice now the highlighted project is the one we just entered. Uh, RQS project. So, you right click on it, right click. You have a menu, then click open so that we can start our measurement. Here we go a blank payment item worksheet. Now, how do you populate the plan payment item worksheet? <laughs> At the bottom right, the add button is there for you to assess the BSMM4 based uh, library explorer. So click on it. So the, li uh, the, the BSMM4 based library, library uh, explorer props up, and that's what you can see. You see the popular elements and the items under each element. We have substructure as the first item there. I will just select two or three items and demonstrate using a real life drawing the measurement of trench excavation. So, to select an item, all you have to do is just click on, use the add button in front of the item to select it. So, you click. I've selected the removal of tree. Tree storm got exceeding 3,000, but not exceeding 4,500. Let me also select vegetation, removal of uh, vegetation and undergrowth. Let me uh, go down and select trenches for foundation not exceeding 2.0 meter. And then uh, let me, for the sake of the presentation, let's select pit for column basis. So, as you select the item from the library explorer based on NIQS BSMM 4R, the item goes to the background with the BSM4 code. So this button up here is the done and close button. Click on the done and close button. Here we go. The item we've selected. So the blank payment item worksheet has the list of the item we've selected. Now, because of the want of our time, let's pick the trench excavation as an example. And let's assume 
we have the PDF drawing. So, all I have to do is, I come up to select views. You can use the software to quantify projects if you have hard copies of the drawings. If you have soft copies as PDF drawings, you can also use the software. You can import the drawing to the software environment, just as I'm going to do right now. So, Smart Drawing View, click on Smart Drawing View. Here we go. Click the open folder icon below to open your PDF drawing. So, click on that. So, it lets me to where on my system I have the drawing. So, if I click on Foundation Plan, for example, Foundation Plan, say open. Here I come. I, I have the drawing now. So, I have my drawing. So, that's my drawing. I can move around and have a feel of the drawing. Now, when you have a drawing like this, and you want to use the smart drawing view, you want to use the smart drawing view, the first thing you do is to identify to embrace the planting of the tree, the usage of technology. Now is the time. If you've not been doing it, now is the time. Because technology will take control of everything. The other resource persons, evidently from the program, you notice they'll be talking about that tomorrow to enlighten us more. This is the time to do that. The more you mayor with software like this, the more proficient you become at the usage of the keyboard. And a lot of other things you do with keyboard, it affects it. So we encourage you, you can take check and stand over there, we can spend more time with you, do more elaborate presentation, join us in a regular weekly online training. You can indicate your name, we add you to the group. Join us, your questions can be answered. Once again, we thank uh, the Mala Mustala Aliyu led board for the support we've gotten from the day of conceiving this project up to this now. President Sir, we're very grateful. We're grateful to you and your team and the administrative staff who do behind the scenes support at the Secretary sec Secretariat. Thank you, dear audience, dear colleagues, for giving attention to what we have. More questions on one-on-one -on -one can be answered later. Thank you. NIQS Foundation. And the presentation will be done by the DG herself, one of our own, Dr. Celestina N. A.K., FNIQS, RQS, MNI. She will be talking about the presentation on introduction of NIQS Foundation to the Pontius of Yours. Can you please put your hands together for Dr. Ike as she comes to the podium? A round of applause for her, please. Every distinguished personality is here. We um, need to thank Mr. President of KSRBN for giving us this slot to talk about the NIQS Foundation. Ours is going to be very friendly and short. Please begin to put the slides on. Like I was introduced, this is NIQS Foundation. We were conceived last year in November by the last executive council members. So, it is with uh, these are the board members of the foundation. Um, Mr. Shegu, Lucia Guajele Koko is our chairman. Myself as the DG of the foundation, then Mr. Sarantin as the secretary of the board, Mala um, Mamutala the KSRBM president, that made it possible for us to be here, is a member. Mr. Olaye Mishonubi, the NIQS president, is a natural member of the board. Any QS president sits on the board. After his tenure, the next president that comes will be on the board. Uh, Mr. Dr. Olarufemi Balogu, the DG of PS Academy, is a member too. Dr. Rabiu Yusuf, FNIQS, is a member. So, with all these people, this is how we have taken off the foundation to make sure that we run smoothly. So, it is with great pleasure that we introduce NIQS Foundation to you. 
The foundation is formed out of the need to assess fund both nationally and globally. So it can carry out cutting edge research towards finding solutions to critical social environmental problems bordering on climate action, gender equality, social housing, infrastructure deficits, affordable and clean energy, economic growth, youth empowerment, sustainability, and other relevant areas of the SDG. What the foundation is all about. With what I've mentioned that we do, um, the bottom line is that there are a lot of funds outside Nigeria and internationally that we need to assess. And for us to do that, we need to you know, establish a foundation, a non-profit kind of foundation that will be able to make us assess it. Because internationally, the UN and EU have these funds lying idle. And NIQS forming this foundation will make us have access to them. So uh, we have established an office. They've given us an office in the second floor of the NIQS headquarters. And uh, we've started our development, our partition work. And um, we need funds, bottom line. We need funds to be able to put infrastructures in place. And we need funds to be able to pay the few staff we'll be able to get to work with us. So we're appealing to you. We have accounts in both in Naira, dollars, euro, and pounds, to please come to the aid of NIQS Foundation. Everything we are doing is for the NIQS. We are working for the NIQS because when these funds come, we're able to do research that borders on sustainability. And the climate change, climate action is the way to go now, and we cannot do it on our own. So we have to start in-house first for people that are quantity surveyors to support us. Few individuals have been able to support us financially and in kind. And uh, if you just want to know, have an idea of what we have done so far, you go to the second floor of NIQS headquarters and see what we have done. We have gone, done so well so far. So please, I'm here on behalf of my chairman and all the board members soliciting for your fund. No matter how small, it will go a long way to help us. But just bear in mind that whatever we are doing, we are doing on behalf of NIQS and for the good of humanity. Thank you. Um, earlier on, we announced that you should take custody of your, your items. Um, somebody lost his, I think his folder or so, but fortunately, um, we found it. The person's name is Egwatu uh, Ikechuku Samuel. If you are that person, please meet me um, when I go back to sit. There's also somebody in the house here who is doing the research and uh, questionnaires have been circulated. Please do well to assist in um, filling the questionnaires for the, the person because the essence of presentation from the president of the board and he will be talking on the functions of the board to us. Permit me to welcome to the podium the president of QSRB and Mala Motala Liu once again. Mr. President, sir. Her, when she said that uh, the purpose is to do A, B, C, D, forgetting that one of the things I think also uh, was as a result of the branding or rebranding the NIQS, I want to project the image of the NIQS beyond, um, beyond uh, just our shows. So that we'll do other humanitarian things that will give us, um, that, that will that will um, project our image and also make us known uh, as conservatives or as NIQS. So, madam, I don't know if I fill in the gap, yes, but I think it's also in addition to just uh, doing such SDG services, it's also to make sure that NIQS or the conservation profession is part of. Uh, an international community uh, effort. Okay. 
Jones that is choosing. Sorry, please. My honest refusal to petition is uh, to clarify certain things. More often than not, people do not understand the difference between the NIQS and the board. I recall the president of NIQS saying that uh, NIQS gave birth to the board. That's true. But then the board is created to give the profession uh, a legal backing and also to give the profession uh, the teeth to buy it. So the Conservation Registration Board of Nigeria is a professional regulatory body established by the act as written there in 1986 it used to be decree number a b c d I don't know, and um, it's now uh, q1 laws of the federation of nigeria 2004. now the whole essence is to regulate the practice of conserving in nigeria in all its aspects and ramifications now that's a very broad uh, assignment and uh, under that, the board is supposed to determine who are conservators for the purpose of this act. Now, anybody, no matter your training, uh, if you do not get qualified by the board, licensed by the board to say you are a conservator, you are not. Now, a section of the Act says to secure in accordance with the provision of the Act the establishment and maintenance of a register of persons entitled to practice as conservators and the publication from time to time of that list. So, this issue of entitled to practice is a very significant one. Entitled to practice. It's not just, um, just a tag. Without the certification of the board, without the licenses, you are not entitled to practice. Another thing is, no, please go back to the last uh, slide. Another thing is determining what standard of knowledge and skills are to be attained by persons seeking to become registered as conservators and raising those standards from time to time as circumstances may permit. Now here, what is significant again is and raising those standards from time to time as circumstances may permit. So here, the statutory duty is not a one-off duty by the board to the profession and its sustenance. It's not just that when you come here and you pick your license, you are through. The board raises those standards from time to time as circumstances permit. Now this is not only for licensing, even for accreditation of institutions. The board also is saddled with the responsibility to approve courses, qualifications, and institutions. We have had challenges with some institutions before, and um, they believe that once they have their academic accreditation, they will not submit themselves to the board's accreditation. Now, the board is to determine who or what institution or what kind of courses you read, what kind of qualification you acquire before the board certifies you or licenses you to practice conserving in Nigeria. And that is why even institutions abroad where our chaps study, we need to review their contents, course contents, to see whether when they come in here, for as long as they will come in here, whether they are qualified to go through the process of registration.
or validation. Now, in the approval of courses of training, the board determines the knowledge and skill that is required. Like I said, that's why the process of uh, uh, accreditation comes. So any institution, either in Nigeria or elsewhere, which the board consider is properly organized and equipped for conducting the whole or any part of the course of training approved by the board, or any qualification which as a result of an examination taken in conjunction with the courses of training approved by the board under the section is granted to the candidates reaching the standard of the examination and uh, of sufficient knowledge and skill to press something in Nigeria. Now the import of the above provision of the Act is that the board is statutorily vested with the powers to conduct professional accreditation in any institution of learning offering the study of conserving courses, whether in part or in full, and upon completion of their studies, license products of such institutions to practice conserving in Nigeria. Now, there's nothing in the Act to suggest that this statutory power of the board is to be shared with any other body in Nigeria pursuant to the Act. So whether you are going to university or a polytechnic, which goes through academic accreditation, if the board does not accredit that institution, for the purpose of this act, doesn't make it qualifiable uh, for us. So, and that's why in some cases we have now reached some level of collaboration with both the NUC and the MBT to ensure that areas of conflicts are not there. So it is therefore the prerogative of the board to periodically, you know, review or demand from all institutions to submit their courses for review and also accreditation. And failure to comply any such training by any such institution. Eh? As the, state, the board has statutory power not only to refuse the accreditation of the institution or withdrawal of such accreditation where already given, but also not to register any person trained by such airing institution as a conservative. So I'm sure this will raise that case of whether we are um, registering a particular institution or not. I'm, I'm raising these issues just to give the, the input of the Act itself before I go to the uh, composition of the board. Please, can you go back to the composition of the board? Yes. The board has 15 members. And these 15 members are a representation of the broad spectrum of the, you know, of the, of the profession itself. Five representatives will come from the various sectors, private practice, contracting, public service, and other special interests. Now, all these five will be appointed through the Minister of Works and Housing for now, because the board now resides under the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing. Then there will be five representatives from the Nigerian Institute of Conservatives. You know the tradition, the, 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 the history or the origin of the board being, um, you know, a, a, a child pushed by uh, the NIQS, give the NIQS the location to, you know, put five representatives on the board. You know, you can recall that in some, in, in some professions, there have been challenges where the registration body also registered another body. In our case, I don't think we'll uh, have that kind of challenge uh, because NIQS is well represented by having five members uh, on the board. Then the academic or training institutions, the universities, polytechnics, monotechnics, uh, were put in four persons. Now, in the case of, in our case now, conventionally what we do, we take two universities and two from polytechnics to represent on the board. So when you add, you have 14 members. There is one representative of the Ministry of Works and Housing also there. So when these 15 people are there, they now sit down on their own to elect 
the president of the board. In our case here, the NIQS, since the beginning of the board, it had been a convention that past presidents of the NIQS had been presidents of the board. And I think that's what um, has given birth to the kind of cordiality we have between the institutions, which is our club, which is our own, with the board, which is the government ends of regulating our activity. The chairman of the board. The board is supposed to hold on for three years. But then there's also a provision in the act that it can be reinstated for another three years final. So this particular board uh, came into effect uh, in 2017 and expired in June 2020. But because of the COVID uh, issue then, the board was not re-inaugurated. Re That's the ninth board until 21st September, which will now have a tenure uh, up to 20th September 2023. So the life of this board will expire on 20th September 2023. Now, um, the board being a government agency, I want to get something clear. Yes, the board is under the supervision of the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing because almost all government bodies must be under certain government structure. But the government, being under government does not give the ministry or the government the leverage to, you know, to determine how the board will act or behave or how the board will carry out its function. So, I think, let's get it clear that um, the minister has some powers, and we'll go there, we'll get there, but the powers are also clearly defined by the Act. That's, um, now, the board has always had a vision. And one of the visions of this board is to become one of the best in the world. And that's by becoming the best in Africa. And also to seek to achieve by making professional ethics, competence, integrity, and pursuit of value for money, probity, accountability, the central focus in our regulatory role within Nigeria. We want to also benchmark ourselves with the similar bodies outside and ensure that we are not below the international benchmark. So far, we can boost our chest in Sabu Kogal will namely transparency. We have been so far doing well from the establishment to date. Accountability, probity, integrity, professional ethics, value for money, and professional competence. You know, here we are also fortunate that uh, two of the past presidents are here, uh, Alej Kawu and uh, Malosin Duku. Uh, I don't know, maybe Mr. Yeme William will still come, but he's not here yet. And you'll also recall that uh, uh, during the last annual assembly, we announced the loss of the first president of the board. So we are a lucky board, and uh, we are typing from the experiences of the previous boards to ensure that we remain online. Like I said earlier on, the minister. The minister may have powers to give direction to the board. Um, a section of the Act, which is um, Section 4 of the Act, said the minister may give to the board direction of general character or relating generally to particular matters. But not to any individual person or case. Now, even the minister doesn't have the power to tell the board what to do or to somebody or a particular case. 
So with regard to the exercise of the board of its functions, and it shall be the duty of the board to comply with the relative. Now before any give, giving any direction under section one of this subsection, uh, sub subsection one under the section four, the minister shall serve a copy of the proposed direction on the board. You know, when you read the act, you will see um, the trend. But the issue is, even where the minister is going to give a direction of general nature, he must also, you know, serve the board with the direction. And then the board will now have the right to make comments and send it back to the minister. And the minister may now take it the way it's brought back, or he may just amend it. This is what I've just said now. Uh, okay. Some of the areas where the minister, you know, uh, has uh, power to in relation to the board is under section. Section 18 of the Act, Regulations, Rules, and Orders. The Minister shall have power to make regulations, rules of order, and this shall include power to make provision for such incidental and supplementary matters as he may from time to time consider expedient for the purpose of this Act, and to make different provision for different circumstances. You know, one of the things we had was Sometimes the Act makes, you know, just a statement. For instance, in Section 5 of the Act, it says the Board shall appoint a fit and proper person to be the Registrar for the purpose of this Act. And it's stopped there. So the Board now will sit down and um, determine or define what is uh, fit and proper. And then get the Minister's approval. And now it becomes a regulation. For instance, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2011, the Honorable Minister uh, of, our, of Lands, Housing and Urban Development that time issued regulations to guide the operations of the board. And the regulations, among other things, highlighted the following like standing order regulating the proceedings of the board meetings, rules and regulations applicable to any person carrying on the practice of conserving Nigeria. Then others like fees to be paid in respect of entry of names on register, issuing a certificate of experience, and so on. All these are the some of the things that you will take to the minister to approve as some of the regulations uh, under the Act. The board operates through committees. Now the the Act has given the board the power to create or rather to organize its own way of um, operating. Now we have, we have, um, for now we have uh, a number of committees. We have the Registration and Certification Committee, which any of us now has passed, has passed through. Um, of course, the registration and uh, education committee is the one that uh, considers the application of those schemes to be registered, recommend the approval of the board, and so on to the end. If you go through these are things that we are all familiar with, we've gone through, you know. And there is a petition committee which I mentioned earlier on. That's the one that determines the criteria and standards for acquisition of professional programs of tertiary institutions of frequent surveying programs in the country. And then from time to time, they develop the strategy, they change the patterns, they up the, set, the scale to ensure that we are within the context of the dynamics of our profession as internationally benchmarked.
But in addition, there are certain things that we need to be doing that will help you. That consider a yearly return of students' enrollment from all institutions. I recommend to the board such measures, which, you know, we're supposed to be getting this feedback. Sometimes we find it difficult to get it from the institutions, but I think it's mandatory that it now so that we know the number of people that may possibly become conservators um, uh, at the end of every period. We have a research and development committee, and here are the functions. Determine the research direction agenda, strong agenda that the board can pursue. Right now, we have uh, cited something at the current board. We've cited um, reciprocity um, arrangement with two premier universities in Nigeria, Amadibele University and uh, Abafemi Awolo University, if it. So we, we are now discussing with them. In fact, as I'm talking to you now, the memorandum of understanding between ABU and Kiosavian is already ready for signing. It has gone through back and forth legal departments, committees, and so on. They are ready for signing. And that of AAU is also going to be ready soon. Um, the purpose of that will be to, you know, integrate uh, our storage of knowledge within the universities and a lot of research that have been carried out and the field, what is happening in the field and in the real world. There are quite a number of things that will benefit both the institutions and the profession. We also have a monitoring and enforcement committee. Now this is a very important committee because we have parks running all around, uh, you know, operating as conservatives in Nigeria. We have people who are even trained in universities and polytechnics, but have refused to either go through the professional training in NIQS or get a license. For instance, there is a one of the inductees today who had been a qualified member of the NIQS since 1999, but it's only been inducted today. So that kind of recklessness, you know, if we find out, we'll make sure we take actions. Because you cannot be practicing without a license. So this committee, the Montana Enforcement Committee, is now collaborating or rather the board is collaborating with the NIQS through this committee and uh, we are using the state chapters as our contact persons with the states to ensure we notice certain things. People practicing um, illegally, people who are not licensed and are practicing, construction going on where qualified conservatives are not used, you know and so on. And when we report, we're going to check measures. A few times we had some infractions, we called the attention of the bodies concerned, whether private or public, and um, so far there isn't much response. But I can tell you, in our meeting yesterday, and I'm oh, sorry, on Monday in the board, we agreed that henceforth, we will not only write you, we will copy the appropriate investigative institutions to ensure that uh, bodies are also doing the right thing. We have disciplinary committee. Uh, you know, like the, the board itself has the right, or rather the, the power, to discipline uh, airing uh, practitioners or those even not licensed to practice. Um, the, and that's why the word entitled to practice here comes. So the disciplinary committee, there's a process. If somebody is found wanting, he'll go through an investigative committee, and after that, he will now end up with the, with the disciplinary committee. And any action taken by the disciplinary committee uh, on a person, only God can save you. But then we have other committees like the administrative committee, the general purpose committee, this one helps the board to run its daily activities, uh, administrative, recruitment, promotions, procurement, and so on. And then we have other, other committees, like uh, the local organizing committee that organized this uh, annual assembly. We have uh, 
Ad hoc Committee on Development of Construction Cost Data. There too, we are collaborating with NIQS to ensure that we have uh, a good basis for relationship. And there's also an Ad hoc Committee on Review of Court Cases. And there was a time we had many court cases, and we're thinking that uh, it's not proper. So we had a committee that would review the cases. Where we need to settle out of court, we settle out of court. Where we need to continue the litigation and so on, we go ahead and do that. Sorry. You know, uh, the president of the board was a peculiar arrangement in the chief executive of the board according to the act, even though he's not full time, but he's the chief executive. While the registrar, who is an appointee of the board, with the head of secretariat, are more like the chief operation officer. And um, below the register, the, during, during the seventh board, sixth and seventh board, there's an elaborate structure that was put. But because we are not funded, we are constrained financially, um, we couldn't fully deploy uh, those structures. For instance, there ought to have been zonal offices to ease you know, the operations of the board. Now the board has only one office. There ought to have been maybe some other offices and places and so on. But we can't afford that now. So at the end of the day, what we are doing is just the slim structure and the material. But as soon as the money comes, or as soon as we are awash with some little funding, the board should be able to have zonal presence so that uh, activities can be at the zonal level, especially when it comes to issues of monitoring and enforcement. Like I said, the board is funded through this activity we are having. People pay the license renewal. Also, when we do the annual assembly like now, the fees and the proceeds uh, from sale of stamps, lapel, pins, and so on. And once in a while, we get some capital grant from the supervisor ministry. It's usually very mega. There are five bodies in the Ministry of uh, house, Works and Housing for now. Uh, those for the estate surveyors, um, um, building, architecture, uh, town planners, and conservatives are not on budget line. So once in a while we get some little grant from government to complement our effort. And that's why we make sure that once in a while, once in a year, we come together, discuss our issues uh, in an event like this, uh, which is the MCPD uh, you know, uh, event that will uh, bring us together, discuss what are the problems of the profession and what are the problems of what to serve a way forward. Now, relationship with the Institute. You know, we, like um, the President said, and like also the, the Speaker of this uh, Assembly said there is a big, good collaboration between the NIQS and the board. And quite a number of times we do things together. And uh, like the development of post data, like the issue of monitoring and enforcement. And um, we are also collaborating on ensuring that uh, conservators pay their dues and our subscription both to the institute and to the board. I've mentioned the other regulatory bodies, apart from Oren and Sokol, I've mentioned five. We are all under the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing. For some curious reason, it's only Oren and Sokol that have enjoyed good patronage in terms of financing. But uh, the remaining five are still struggling to even be part of the budget line. So the, this is a little story about the board and I will employ every one of us here 
to please ensure that we have uh, a copy of the Act and the regulations that uh, develop uh, in addition to or rather drive from the Act to ensure that we understand and appreciate the functions of the board and separate the board from the NIQS. Once in a while you hear people saying that what's QS Arabian doing about this and that? QS Arabian doesn't have to do uh, what you are asking for. But if it will help, and if you support the NIQS to do the right thing or to do the needful for its members, I can assure you that uh, the, the board will do that. Um, we also have a good relationship with the head of service. Once in a while, we try and get um, uh, input on government um, circulars and so on, because whether we like it or not, even though we are a regulatory, almost independent body, but we are also within the purview of uh, the public sector. Uh, we also relate with the Accountant General's office. All payments are made through Remitter. Uh, we operate the Remitter account, and uh, we have to be responsible in terms of uh, the financial management uh, of uh, the board. Um, I've discussed regulations. Uh, the, there's a booklet that was developed by the seventh board on regulations. Please, we must also, if we don't have copies, we must pick them. And uh, that booklet has given step-by-step -step description of uh, what's uh, what we must know as conservatives. Please let's um, try and get uh, the, the because some of the highlights of that uh, like duties and powers of the conservatives board, disciplinary powers of the board, meaning of professional misconduct, meaning of informal conduct, and penalty for unprofessional conduct. In addition, there's also the, when the when the resource person on ethics was talking to us, she spoke about the ethic court. The ethic court, like she said, is an external police. The uh, inner police is the conscious. So uh, copies of the ethic court are available. And please, conservatives, make sure that by the time they leave here, they pick copies of the ethic court uh, for their attention. So I think apart from this, um, unless if there are questions about what the board represents or what the board is, uh, I'll be glad to clarify certain issues. Uh, apart from that, I would say thank you very much. For what the QS RBN is doing about QS entry point in public service. While we start at level 8, medical doctors start at 12, architects at 9, engineers at 10, lawyers at 10 and accountants at 9. Yes, we, we face that challenge. We, fortunately, uh, Dr. Tina Eke is here. We've been liaising with the Office of the Head of Service. It's an establishment matter. Uh, we have made a case that conservatives also spend as long as um, at least engineers stay uh, in the university. I think we spent four years, the engineers five years, five years, the engineers also spent five years, the accountants also five years. So the, the, the pardon? Well, I don't know about accountants, but I know engineers spent five years. Now, the, the problem we had was that um, while the location, the ministry, was populated mostly by engineers, and previously they were able to make the case. We are still very few within the service. So it's now that we are now springing up 
and come in, you know, to limelight and we are pushing and making the effort to say, look, if you can go for A, you should do it, you know, to search for B. So we are, we are Metro and Sunday. It has to be a memo that will come through the establishment. The head of service of one of the neighboring states, FCT, or the chairperson that was heading the, the arrangement, or rather the reestablishment of such. And we have uh, had meetings with her, and uh, we've been asked to put a memo together. And I believe that by the next council of establishment, we'll represent our case. But we've made cases, and uh, we are also making efforts. But again, it's for the government to be under pressure to do that. We'll also welcome suggestions because there are cases in the public service. Actually, we are, when we discuss in the board, most of the blame went to them. They have been timid. They've been, you know, hiding their heads. Maybe until now they are not even, nobody even knows their cases in the, civil, the, the public service. So they must give us the strategy to use, apart from the one we are deployed now. Well, I can assure you that the board is doing its best to ensure that QS in public service are also brought at par with their own colleagues in the other services at the entry level. Thank you. Concerned about the activities of quacks who are taking our jobs and denying us of uh, what we should be doing rightfully as professionals. And I'm also glad to particularly hear from you when you were making your presentation about the mention of the Committee on Enforcement and um, Monitoring. But my worry is we're supposed to be liaising with the chapters. But I don't know how effectively that has been because I'm in Lagos. I work in Lagos. I know what is happening in Lagos. So many projects are being run to completion without any QS involved. We are all witnesses to the 21-story building that collapsed recently. I'm not aware of any county surveyor that was on that project. So please, I want to advise, if we are liaising with the chapters, we need to actually move closer to the chapters and possibly have some people who will be like a tax force at the chapter level. And they can pick some states. For instance, Lagos, Portacos, Kaduna, and others. Okay. okay, the president wanted to... Yes, at the retreat we have for the current National Executive Council member, in January, it was specifically said to the chapters who had all the chapter chairpersons in attendance that each chapter was supposed to set up a standing committee to be headed by the deputy chairperson for that chapter. And the reason is simple. We know that the chapter chairmen are always very busy. The deputies are less busy. And this particular committee to be headed by the deputy chairperson was supposed to send quarterly reports to the national that we will forward to the KSRB. So I, I believe we, we are on track on that. So unless there are any other issues. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I believe if we could move this route, it will help a great deal. Our members are suffering. They are yearning for jobs and they are trained, but they don't have jobs to do. And if we could do this, we can even use the instrumentality of the KSRBN to take some people to court, those who are taking our jobs. Estates of yours have done it successfully, and we should do the same thing we need to. Secondly, sir, from your presentation, we have been running based on convention. And I know because of stability and relationship with NIKS and all that. But QSRBN, as a regulatory body, is to keep the law. We must also be seen to be obeying the law. And I noticed that in some of the sections, section two 
talks about composition of the board, which you highlighted to us. And one of them, the first one is the president of the board, which is supposed to be by election. And if that is the case, I believe that we should be having a forum that we will be doing this. But I'm looking at, if it's possible, at the BGM of NIQS, when we are electing maybe the president, because the time we come without the president of NIQS, they will all have occupied the position of the board. So a time can come that we can see some very inspiring young people who have ideas, who can even head QSRBM. So if we need to do that, we can then at that BGM conduct that election and ensure that we elect the president of the board. Even if we are going to take from the group of past presidents that are present, we can do that. Everybody can participate. Secondly, on the members that will represent the NIQS, is also supposed to be by election, not by nomination. Five members of NIQS. We have been doing this by convention. I believe we can progress to the point that we can begin to do some of these things as stipulated in the Act, because as keepers of the law, we must also be seen to be obeying the law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so on the issue of parts, the so that there will be a fair liaison between him and the chapter, deputy chapter chairman who are NIQS and not QSR again. So this is just concluded. So I'm sure from now on you begin to see action. And in fact, in our meeting on Monday, we agreed that we'll begin to copy all such correspondences that we have of infractions with the ICPC in case people public in case on public buildings or public structures there's no response we we'll deploy other means of uh, getting enforcement done. that is for the so that's an is that's a job going on now on the issue of composition of the board um, I think when I say convention and that's why I said convention I said so far by convention and I'm not prescribing how presidents of NIQS and QSRB should emerge. And since so far our convention is been by coincidence that past presidents of NIQS have been the presidents of the board. And where that is the case, if by the wisdom of those selected or elected to be on the board, they decide to throw it open. Because you cannot elect a president of a body outside that body. You cannot, you cannot elect the president of QSIBN in an NIQS body, by a convention or, 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 or AGM or BGM. I think the, whoever are there that are elected or selected in whatever way that are there can determine who becomes the president of the board. That's number one. Number two, the, the issue of um, representation. Now, um, what the act says, five persons to be appointed by the minister, of whom one shall be appointed from the ministry under his control, another four pers another persons from among the interests in the field. So this, there's a caveat there, covered by this one, which in his opinion are not adequately represented. So every other thing that came there came as a convention, like, I mean, what they say is um, um, special interest. Like that's a time when a banker was uh, put there, but she was quite severe, she was on the board, but, you know, special interest. Or maybe there's some gender balancing or whatever. Okay, that would have nothing to do. But when they said five persons elected by the NIQS, now that becomes the business of the NIQS. Okay, on whether selection is election, nomination is election, Appointing his election will be a matter for the legals to interpret, but that becomes an entirely matter of the NIQS. Okay, but as for the for the election of the president, if you have um, if you have a candidate in mind, they should make sure that some of the representative of the NIQS that will come should come from the. You should have that your candidate uh, from the O from the university or whatever 
to be one of the nominees because the minister will also nominate. So when they come together and they look at each other, they will know who appropriately can be the president of the board. But like I said, so far, the convention had been for those who had presided over the NRQS and happy to be nominated in one way or another had become the president. Maybe it will change. Like architects, I think the current president of Akon was not a president of, of uh, NIA. So maybe when we mature to that level, we will get there. But as for the NIQ side, election or selection or nomination or appointing or imposing, I think NIQ will take care of that. There's an online participant who says, we will appreciate if the board president can share few reports or regulation of firm. I don't know what exactly that means. If he means copies of the regulation, I think they should be available to each person. But if he means that how we can regulate firms from practicing. Yes, the board regulates. Um, the boards will review firms and register them. And from time to time, we also uh, expect that the principles of those firms are. Where, and one of the things we have started recently is that where a person is not up to date in his commitment to the board and he has a registered firm, it will affect the firm. So if that's what you mean by regulating firms, fine. But if you mean sharing reports, um, sharing the regulations, we have, uh, I think we have that available at Secretariat. We can get them. And I think we're also trying to develop uh, some online capability where the act, the regulations, and all will be uh, on the platform so that uh, everybody can share. For now, we, we have a robust uh, website. I think we should visit it. Uh, we can make online payments for any services via portal. We can, you know, auto electronic generation of receipts already taking place. Um, renewal, assessment, and printing of annual license online. Housing the RIQS and firms details and accessing required information with the click of the button. Registration of applicants can now be uh, now been fully completed online with less paperwork. In events registration, virtual participation, certificate printing, and so on are all going on. Official emails for board members for now and staff are being created. And I think we want to make sure that all official correspondences will use the firm's uh, IPQ uh, uh emails so that they become resident in the IQS. Then Institutions accreditation status can also be verified online. And then RQS and firms financial finance financial outstanding is now auto-computed and made available. Now we only want to make sure, I mean appeal to members who or country service who are not who have not updated their own data on the data bank to please do that. In case when you check you find that there are certain gaps, please fill the so that we have a clear record of uh, you. Yes, please. Uh, Where is the mic? I have one here. Needs you to have five members represented at the board. And I'm going to read them out based on our constitution, sir. So that the <coughs> members who are here, new members, will also be guided. I'm reading from the constitution, please. Represent representation in QS RBN. The institute shall be represented on the Quantity Surveillance Registration Board of Nigeria by the following five members. By the following five members. One, the Deputy President. Two, the Vice President. Then three, registered members with not less than 10 years post MNIQS election appointed by the NEC of NIQS. So just to, so that uh, the issue of election by QS, GDA, okay, at QS by Mr. GDA, okay, 
the issue of election has been subsumed by the Constitution. And the Constitution says, appoint. I don't think there is any contradiction in the usage of the English. So, and uh, I believe if uh, USDO feels in the contrary, we should wait when we eventually amend the Constitution to allow a place for election. But as it is today, sir, it is nomination. Sorry, it is appointment. Thank you. Thank you. The, and I, I will tell you something. I was wishing that the board will have younger elements within the board. But the NIQS constitution has given a benchmark that if you don't cross certain level, you can't be at the board. Okay? So if we're going to get somebody young into the board, we have to go and beg the minister or at the academic institution to send somebody. You understand? But we must have a mix in the board where uh, because of the challenges of um, dynamics of the profession, we must have a mix of the young and the old assembly, oh, sorry, your old BGFO, whatever, or pursuing amendment, you can take care of that. As of now, we will never... If I'm permitted to go, after you finish the administration board, what started, and it was the handful of the young dynamics with the old that got the 1986 registration board act in place. Some of them are here. Madaki, then it was Kangua, Lapai, and uh, I think uh, the, of the exposure, the experience, the necessary self-group interest of the points of yours to help in directing the affairs of that world. And that tradition is very good. It brings stability. I've seen other reports where somebody who has never been in the top echelon of the professional body became a member and it was a confusion. They went to court. The whole profession was halted. There was no more development. And we don't want that. The US has a very systemic approach to things. We are problem solvers. And when things work for us, we must continue to go that line so that we can continue to grow uh, in a geometrical way or exponential way. So that I wanted to add, as far as the registration board is concerned, and I think we're doing well, it's doing well. Whoever wants to be part of the board must work very well within the NIQS to get recognition. And that is the, that's the way to be there. Then those who are in, outside of it, let them get recognition through the minister and what to do when they establish themselves well within those frontiers. Um, so, I rest my case as far as that is concerned. The other thing I need to back on, because I will be here tomorrow, is concerns the foundation. Unfortunately, our DG was cut short or sabotaged. I didn't know. If NIQS must take a global recognition, you need something that can speak of you over time. What have you contributed to the societal growth, to the economic growth, to the world global thinking? And that's why the SDG became part of what became our objective. Because when you say you support UN SDG, and it helps to unify you with the global thinking and they give your profession the recognition that can help to lift you to that place where that U.S. name will be known. And you thrill the view, you become a trailblazer in our built environment, which is what we have been trying to do. Because the U.S. is versatility. It has that robustness that can push it to that level where it can be at the head of the built environment, which is what we, we are trying to do with this foundation. Once you inch yourself into that foundation, anybody who has arrived always have a foundation. <laughs> Go and look at it the, at the micro level and at the higher level. So it is to push us to that international recognition and for the benefit first for our members who are into researchers and then to get 
greater recognition even within your country as to issues that borders on sustainability and what have you. So it is a must. We are starting very early because some until after 100 years they don't get their foundation in place. But we are starting at 50 to make sure that that we can leap forward to another level of recognition. Then um, the last one that I needed to talk about. So please put your phone there, small drops. You know, if you are on the plane, almost every airline now has foundation because it gives you visibility. That's your contribution to society. So we must all put some money there to start it off. But well, we'll get fund internationally, and that is where the, the real McCoy is. When you do well, and it's been set up properly, and uh, I wish they could have shown you the sectarian how it's been done, uh, it's been constructed. Then, um, finally, on the theme of the, uh, of the uh, conference, as well. uh, I told Mr. President that coincidentally, next week the Kenya Board of Architects and Conservation they have are doing something on the future of the profession too. And I said they consult each other. But you know, when you when you think in a positive direction, you always align together. And I was surprised because I'm invited to speak there. And I want to suggest to Mr. President that this, the future of the U.S. is in skill acquisition. It's not just going to degree. The skill we have come to start with uh, the, our PhD guy has done is a major step forward for the profession if we have that software in place to manage our conservation process. And of course, there is the beam that we must know and know well. And I want to suggest that we put that into maybe next year. Beam for two, three days, exhaust it, and let everybody know that the future of the QS and in the built environment has to be with beam, building information management. And we must have a, an exhaustive section on it. It's becoming a global way of uh, uh, practicing the profession in the built environment. And there are so many other software that have come into place. If the registration board can put this into part of what they want uh, members to know, then uh, the the reason for certain institutes precedent. And I think we don't want to get to that level. By the time you go through NIQS as a president, you don't want to compete again with the incoming president. You defer to him as the president of the institute. And then you play a role as a regulator. But it doesn't matter, I mean, it's the wisdom of the profession. If the future comes in such a way that um, we can get some vibrant young elements who will keep their heads level and then preside over anything, we should encourage that. Um, secondly, on the, on the issue of the foundation, somebody asked whether, what's the difference between the Falcon Heart and the NIQS Foundation? The two are different. The Falcon Heart is our, it's not a foundation actually, it's a, it's a, it's a charity. It's our in-house arrangement where we are supposed to, if we're, if we're taken properly, we're supposed to support our indigenous members or where some support is required to our membership. So it's strictly an internal thing. But from what the GDG showed about the NIQS Foundation, we're going into other frontiers, and we can collaborate with other foundations, internationally or locally, to deliver things um, outside the scope of the Pan-Saviour Services. So I think the two are totally different, like President Jalabogo said. One is a responsibility we have for the society, and conservatives can benefit, no problem. But it's for the larger society. The Eagle, or is it Falcon Heart Charity, is for our own membership. 
So these are the two, these are the differences. Somebody, because somebody asked, can they be matched? I said, no, there are two different things. We should try and develop a group both for the Falcon Heart, help our members, support them whenever they are in the situation that they need help. For the NIQS Foundation, it's a journey we're starting to partner with the global society. Then, um, you spoke about three things. Well, we, we, we will discuss that tomorrow, and uh, I know that uh, the two resource persons have done an elaborate work, and I'm confident that uh, we'll not prevent them. Tomorrow we'll be excited, but I think what is important is the realization that every profession is being interrogated, and we must we must wake up and make sure that we survive in a better way or we survive differently, but we must survive. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Mr. Daniel. I'm the sales manager precast for Juno Pleasure Nigeria. Um, we have come to distribute some hands as a show of uh, solidarity to the board for the quality surveyors that yes, um, I know this is a meeting event for us and this has been done for a while but uh, I can assure that this will continue as the time goes on. We hope that by next year it will be bigger and better and our support will be more than this. So thank you everyone.